Welcome back to another episode of Ask a GN. As always, leave your questions in the comment section below if you have them. There were a lot of good questions last time. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but hopefully get through a good amount of these in the very least. Before diving into the Ask GN content, it is again brought to you by AMD FreeSync devices, including this LG monitor, which is a 34-inch display, 3440 by 1440 and has the usual assortment of letters and numbers that is difficult to remember, but I think I got it. I think it's 34UM88-P. Nailed it. Didn't even have to check. <laughs> so that is a, that's an $800 display, 3440 by 1440 with FreeSync. We'll have a link in the description if you're curious to learn more about it. So let's get to the first question. First one is brought to you by Forens Gaming Tech, who says... Steve, a new question concerning high performance cards on low resolutions where you see a performance ceiling. We saw this in your Titan XP review and you talked about this in TG TGW, which is Tech Gaming Weekly that is hosted by Joker Productions. I was on there uh, a couple days ago. I'll be on there again on Wednesday of this week. So he said, uh, Foreign Gaming Tech says, could you explain why a Titan XP and a GTX 1080 have the same performance at 1080p? i.e. why even a 6950X may be bottlenecked in this situation. So uh, we were not using a 6950X. I don't know how that would perform exactly. We were using a 5930K. It's a bit lower end than a 6950X. But ignoring that, uh, in our specific test case where we had a 5930K, I don't know what game I was talking about at the time, but uh, may have been GTA 5 at 1080p probably. With a Titan X and a GTX 1080, I think with GTA 5, we hit somewhere around the same 134 FPS range or something like that. So that could be a few things. One, depending on, well, the obvious point is that there's obviously a bottleneck elsewhere in the system. This is almost always the CPU. Some games, very specific ones, like I think F1 2012 does actually have some memory bottlenecks at some points, which is pretty interesting, but not common. Uh, normally a CPU bottleneck, and the reason that happens is either you've enabled a CPU intensive setting in the graphics, maybe the game does its physics processing on the CPU or something like that, or some other thread management job allocation function, the engine is not really particularly friendly with the CPU. You might be stacking one thread or one core a lot more heavily than anything else in the system, and that could cause a choke point. Uh, things like that, which are just optimization items on the game side normally, that can cause it. But most commonly, it's something where because the CPU has to do work for every frame created, there's going to be a limit at which the CPU can effectively no longer keep up with the GPU. So you could put a Titan X in there. You could put maybe three Titan Xs in there. If, if, if I had them, I'd do this to demonstrate it. But if you have like uh, say, let's keep it single cards for easier demonstration. You have a Titan X versus a GTX 1080. We showed that, uh, maybe even have other 1080s that vary in frequencies in there. They might all perform within a couple frames of each other, which shouldn't really happen, at least with the Titan XP. And that is, uh, I mean, obviously demonstrated when you increase the resolution to 1440 or 4K, it starts becoming more GPU bound. And so now you can see the differences between the GPUs more easily. This is also why we try to use as high end a CPU as possible for GPU benchmarking, but you're still gonna run into limits. Uh, and when the CPU is trying to keep up with the GPU and creating these frames, one of the things that it most commonly does uh, fall behind in is the draw calls. So every time for DirectX 11, OpenGL, older APIs basically that are higher level and have these abstraction layers between the components and the software, you have these abstraction layers in between. Every time primitives need to be created or polys or whatever, the GPU is effectively, it's communicating with the CPU for every one of those draws. That's called a draw call. And that's a problem. That's why low level APIs are promising. We still need to see better implementation, but you get the idea where low level APIs can bypass some of that. Uh, so that's normally where the bottleneck is, but there are other reasons as well, like physics or something like that if it's CPU bound. Next question is from Ryan Razor, who says, would you consider putting a GTX 1070 Micron VRAM issue out there? None of YouTubers say anything about it, whereas forums are filled with posts. Uh, every review on YouTube has Samsung version of memory. Could you do a comparison of the 1070 with Samsung versus Micron? So I don't have both of those. Uh, that's, that's why we, we haven't done a comparison. It's as simple as that. As far as talking about it, 
I suppose the, the issue that's in reference here is basically a supply side change. So uh, some GTX 1070s shipping now have Micron memory, whereas the ones that shipped out initially had Samsung memory. And this happens pretty regularly. It's not new to the 1070s. Uh, and the reason it happens is just the suppliers, the manufacturers trying to keep up with demand. So in this specific instance, Samsung doesn't output the same quantity of memory modules uh, that is required to produce the GPUs in demand by the buyers. And so NVIDIA or whomever, EVGA, AIB partners, have to source their memory from multiple vendors. In this case, they're introducing Micron to the mix. So they have two sources of memory. They can try and keep up with the stutter step of the supply, basically, to produce more cards. So that's the idea. Now, as for the performance difference, I don't know the technical reasons why this is happening at a low level, uh, but basically, as I understand it, and I don't have one of these cards, as I understand it, the Micron memory doesn't overclock quite as high as the Samsung memory, and that's kind of the crux of the issue. Uh, Ryan Razor here is saying that some people report stuttering, checkerboarding, BSODs. I think that's mostly happening with overclocking, but I, I really can't validate it personally. So let's just go on that for now. Uh, there is a BIOS update out there. If you apply it from what I've been told by partners and by uh, some of our users, the BIOS update should resolve the issue where you can get those overclocks without the same stuttering or BSOD or checkerboarding issues, basically artifacting uh, that's being seen on the non-BIOS updated cards. So that's as much as I know. That's, that's really the, that's the start and the end of my knowledge of this right now. Until I have a device in hand, I will not comment any further on it. There's no point because I can't test it. So if we get a 1070 device with Micron memory, maybe we can test it, do a BIOS update, see uh, if this is actually an issue or if it's resolved with that BIOS update. But that's the idea. That's what's going on if anyone's curious. Uh, as far as I understand it, though, it's not a huge issue if you are not doing memory overclocking. But if you've had issues with it, please feel free to leave a comment and let me know because that'd be good for me to know about. Next comment is from Alex Gray who says, Hi Steve, you mentioned in previous videos that 18-inch MSI laptops are the same design as Fanebooks. Is MSI buying Fanebooks and upping the specs? Are the Fanebooks down spec MSI machines or are they just using identical third-party chassis? What's the relationship between MSI and Fanebook? Fanebook is a brand by, or a model, I should say, by CyberPower. CyberPower is a system integrator or an SI. They compete with Origin, iBuyPower, folks like that. So they're the SI. SIs often source their notebooks from somewhere else. They don't generally actually make them. Uh, so Origin and CyberPower and iBuyPower, just as three kind of larger companies, all use MSI for one of their suppliers for laptops. So MSI makes the actual unit, generally. They do actually have a supply themselves too, though. But MSI is effectively the, the OEM, and it's rebranded by CyberPower, Origin, whomever. The reason you might buy one or the other is because, as I think is pointed out here, is sometimes there's different specs that are only available through one partner and maybe not through the source. And the other reason is uh, add-ons. So in the case of some of the SIs, like CyberPower and iBuyPower, and I think also Origin, the last I tested, they don't really do all the bloatware that you'll get straight from MSI. So there are some value adds to be had, uh, but that's the relationship. Basically, MSI makes the units, and CyberPower, the others, buy it and sell it as their own model laptop. Uh, Clevo and Sega are also really popular supplier or, or OEMs for notebooks. Next question, brand new tracks. <laughs> Do you get bored of reviewing products? I mean, like, does it get stale until you get the next latest and greatest? Not really, to be honest, because it's such a crunch to get all of the production done and testing every time. We are, I'm normally writing scripts for videos and uh, right up until we film it, and then I'm writing the review for it as it's being edited. Uh, so it's pretty fast paced. I don't really get bored of them. I, I would probably say I wouldn't want to review four 1050s, for example. That would maybe get a bit boring, or at least uninteresting, if not boring. Uh, but there, there's almost always something you can find, whether it's a really cool design or a really bad design or something like that. So there's always something to look out for, and that's the fun part. The part that would not be fun is if you are running into a lot of issues with a product that are not easily explained, 
or again with a low end like a ten fifty hundred dollar card uh the manufacturers you know they're cutting corners they have to it's a hundred dollar card so they're not going to have that interesting cooling solutions but they could still have interesting flaws and that's always fun to look for so no i don't really get too bored of reviewing things uh i would say more overloaded with reviewing things is, is more of the problem than bored next question uh widge kurt says hi steve a while ago the pump of my 980 ti broke down after fiddling with it seemed to start working again about at roughly 50 percent speed i uh, wanted to the rma the card temp seemed fine pumps less audible basically what should i do uh, so i don't know how you're reading your pump rpm because the hybrid cooler the pump is connected straight to the video card and you, there's as far as i'm aware no way to read the pump rpm Maybe if you plugged it into the motherboard, but you'd need something to adapt the connector because it's not the same fan connector as you'd find from a fan to a board. So uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure where you're seeing your speed. Maybe if you're going based on noise, but I think what's more likely the case is, uh, I don't know, maybe some air pocket got sucked through the, the radiator, the pump, and you had noise reduction after that went through. Uh, if you have your radiator with the tubes mounted at the top, flip it around. That would help. But yeah, if you think there's actually an issue, I would definitely warranty it before it runs out because uh, you don't want it to fail again later. If you don't think there's an issue, which it doesn't sound like there's necessarily an issue. Um, but uh, yeah, check the, the radiator orientation, I guess, is probably what I would do first. Famous Killer 5 says, do you know or do you test your, how do you test your GPU overclocks? Is Valley enough? I've read everywhere on the internet, and you've said it too, that synthetic benchmarks are not real-world scenarios, meaning that some overclocks will pass from the benchmark and be unstable in games. How do you test yours? So we test ours by, I've shown this in the How to Overclock Your RX 480 video. I normally launch the stress test for 3 d Mark and let it run while I tweak the clock settings and frequency, voltage, all that stuff, and see if it fails during that process, and it will eventually fail. And then from that point, dial it back to where it's stable in 3D Mark, and then start testing in games. So I'll do a couple test passes in like Shadow of Mordor, The Witcher, things like that, where you get varying boost and load levels on the cards. Uh, and then at that point, after just a couple passes of those, normally it's, you've got a pretty good idea of if it's stable or not. Now, ideally, if you're a user applying a clock for effectively permanent use, you might want to do. Uh, an in-game benchmark like Dirt Rally or something and let it run overnight. But that's the basics of it. Yeah, I, I would not use just a synthetic test, basically, because uh, it'll look a lot higher than what it's actually capable of oftentimes, and especially that's true with Furmark. Next question, Josh Orenberg says, this is a big question. Uh, <clears throat> you guys always say there's no such thing as a good or bad company, only a good or bad product. So to clarify that, the reason I... I tell people, tell writers to that phrase is because I don't want people writing in articles things like, we trust company A. Company A is a good company because uh, everyone can screw up in the industry. So um, products, I go by this product is good, this product is bad, not the company that makes it. Um, so that, that stated, that clarified. The question is, is there a variance in quality lifespan of a product like motherboard video card memory for different manufacturers or are they all pretty much on level playing field? Uh, can you trust all Strix cards, for example, or EVGA cards from any lineup, any company to have similar build quality or lifespan among their lineup of components? So uh, is it even possible to make accurate estimate of probable lifespan for each product type? It's sort of, not really. <laughs> um, not for us, that's, that's more of a, a validation lab thing to do, like something they would hopefully do internally where you get MTBF numbers. Not for a media outlet though, we don't have enough sample size. But uh, the question, well, except for things like pumps where you know the liquid will permeate the tubes within five years or something like that. But uh, the question, there is variance in products. They use different suppliers for their components. You might have one video card uh, just taking this if you have like a Strix card versus a higher end Hall of Fame or a classified card or something like that, just the supplier of the VRM alone will be different and impact how things play out. Uh, and there's plenty of examples of, of where that's a good or a bad thing depending on what brand or what product you're looking at. 
motherboards. There, so much has moved to the CPU these days that they are less important than they used to be. Uh, a lot of stuff's integrated. A lot of controllers are integrated. You don't need to solder them onto the board anymore. But there's still variants. It's still possible to buy a board that's more likely to fail than, or more likely to overclock better uh, than another board. And that's generally dictated by things like the power design, the components used, capacitors used. Uh, you look just again at motherboards, you might have killer networking versus Intel, something that makes your life miserable versus Intel's networking solution. I've had bad experiences with killer. Uh, so yeah, there are differences, but there is definitely a point where something like memory, which is more of a commodity at this point, is, uh, is not quite as varied in what you're buying, especially for gaming, where it's not going to be as much of an impact or any way to your performance. So that's the short of the, uh, the answer. Last question. I'm amazed this channel isn't bigger after seeing the subscriber count. Just join the ranks. Uh, by the way, what do you think about the NX? So first of all, stand up or shut up which is the name of the user, by the way, not me saying that to them. <laughs> the user's name is Stand Up or Shut Up. Uh, it is called the Nintendo Switch, okay? It's not NX anymore. Everyone knows that, get with the program. Uh, so my thoughts, I think the Nintendo NX is pretty interesting. Um, it will, from a hardware perspective alone, it's Tegra. I said it'll be Pascal, we'll see. I, I'm fairly positive that's right, but it's been in development for a little while, so some folks are suggesting Maxwell. NVIDIA's text on their blog did say that the Switch will be using something, I don't know the exact quotes, but paraphrase something like the best or the latest architecture used in the world's most powerful gaming GPUs, which is what NVIDIA says to me in Pascal. So that was my assumption. Either way, it'll have a Tegra SoC, Pascal or Maxwell. I'm leaning towards Pascal. Uh, the, the portability will be interesting from a battery life testing standpoint. I think it's a very risky move, and I think that's what Nintendo needs right now because they're getting a lot of pressure from PlayStation and Xbox and the traditional market, and they hold the handheld market. There's really not much out there for competition. So merging the two means they can merge their development and hopefully have better output for two types of player bases on one device with one set of coding. Uh, so it's interesting. We'll see how it actually works, what the battery life is, stuff like that. But I've got more thoughts in the original NX slash Switch announcement specs video we did. So check that out if you're curious for more. As always, Patreon, like the post for video, helps out directly. Subscribe for more content. It helps out a lot. So do hit that subscribe button. I'll see you all next time. Thirty four UM eighty eight dash P.